Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 21st of September 2022 coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC Hello. and me David G7RP. Lovely to be back with you on tonight's show. Nick G4FAL is here with a fascinating talk about the transatlantic tests. We show an innovative way to hide a mast and we find out what on earth this is. And we have had some entries, but if you think you know what that is and you haven't sent us an email already, then by all means pop it on a message on either BATC or Facebook and we'll read it out with the others in a moment. But first, your club news. And this is the first NARC Live since the death of Queen Elizabeth. Bob G6PWS sent us some pictures of his visit to London to join the eight hour queue. He says it's very emotional to say the least. Uh, no cameras were allowed in the hall, but there, were, there are a few pictures of what he did take. Firstly, he said we laid my granddaughter's stones, which he spent two days in creating. So he laid those in various places. And there were lots and lots of flowers everywhere. And also, meeting other people along the way, we found that a few of them had got special words and found special poems and things, including this one, which he wasn't sure, Bob wasn't sure who wrote it, but we've traced it to an English poet called Joanne Boyle. And we picked this one, which Bob sent us to read to you with some pictures. Philip came to me today and said it was time to go. I looked at him and smiled as I whispered that I know. I then turned and looked behind me and seen I was asleep. All my family were around me and I could hear them weep. I gently touched each shoulder with Philip by my side. Then I turned away and walked with my angel guide. Philip held my hand as he led the way to a world where kings and queens are monarchs every day. I was given a crown to wear, or a halo known by some. The difference is up here, they are worn by everyone. I felt a sense of peace. My reign had seen its end. Seventy years I had served my country as the people's friend. Thank you for the years, for all your time and love. Now I am one of two again, in our palace up above. Thank you for sharing that with us, Bob. And thanks, Tammy, for finding those pictures from the web. And in conclusion to the Queen's passing, um, the... The guys who are on the Monday Night Net here in Norfolk also have asked us to send a card. You may remember every week we show you a card like this, which we can send. We've got a Best Wishes version, but we've also got a Sympathy Card version of this. And they, the people who are on the Monday Night Net have asked us to send one to uh, uh, sorry, King Charles and the Royal Family at Buckingham Palace. So we'll be, we've done that, we've signed it, and we're going to send it in tomorrow's post. A few weeks ago, we heard from Donard M0KRK, who just spent a few days on Valencia Island, having written an extensive technical report on the 3,000 kilometre transatlantic undersea copper cable, dating from 1858, which has also now been proposed for UNESCO World Heritage status. Well, during the dinner, the head of BT Island presented Donard's wife Anne with a beautiful bouquet of flowers. And at breakfast the next morning, the Canadian ambassador presented a box of chocolates. And this picture shows Donard outside the meteorological station on Valencia Island. Thanks for sharing that, Donard. You did tell us all about your paper some months ago. And we're really pleased that you managed to present it uh, and attend that in person. Uh, finally, if you've ever wondered how to disguise that radio mask that you've always dreamt of, 
but you don't think you could get away with. Well, this might be an idea for you. I found this online on the Daily Telegraph, believe it or not. And yes, if you look close enough, you can see, well, that's what their words say. The phone mast, which is disguised as a giant tree likened to a gigantic toilet brush by angry residents. It does look a bit like a toilet it, brush. <laughs> it does. Really. I don't think I'd want that in my back garden, do you? I don't think, I think I'd rather see a mast, but uh, yeah, it doesn't, it's just too perfect as well, hmm. isn't it? That's the other problem with it. it just, well, I can't that, believe that's that real. Wouldn't that cause some interference, though, having that on there? What the tr well, I suppose, yeah, it depends what they're made of. And I guess when they get wet, they might. But they would have thought of that. I think the, the aerials and the antennas are actually at the top of the pool still there. But mm. I wasn't serious, Tammy. No, I don't okay. really want to do that. <laughs> anyway, hope that brings you some fun. Tammy, little people. Yep, little people. It's all about bananas this week. Oh, really? Yep. Okay, one of my, my favourite food. Here you go. Go bananas. Oh, wow. How to make an easy video camera. Yes. Sorted. All out of a banana and a miniature, miniature calendar. Uh, sorry, miniature and a tripod. Lovely. Thank you for that. That's miniature-calendar.com. As I say every week, one of these pictures, a different one every day, and Tammy picks one for us to have a look at. So what have you been doing? I know it's only every other week, roughly, that we meet now, but we still love your news. Uh, of what you've been doing, whether it's radio related, electronics related, and or even something else as well. It's all about keeping the club together. Anything you have for us, send us to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. There we are. It's the email address at the bottom of your screen now. And if you can get them to us by the very latest three o'clock on the Wednesday of Not Live, but ideally as soon as you can, it helps us put the programme together a little bit earlier as well. Thank you. So, um, Back to that competition that we showed you this picture and asked what on earth is this it's pretty tricky i think but uh, as you'll find out we had some really good ingenious ingen genius it's ingenious that's the word isn't it uh answers has anybody asked us online by the no, way they don't know no, what this is no. all right so firstly david m6 dpz he says is it either a chemical laboratory flask clamp or a clamp for a telescope. Remember that one. Uh, Nev M0 NFY, is this week's What on Earth? Is it a device to hold tubes or pipes in a vice, e.g. to hold a bicycle frame without damaging the metalwork? John, <laughs> I love this one. John G8VPE says, remember this was a couple of weeks ago now, is it a clamp for holding the new Prime Minister's crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, John G Zero MXN. It looks like a clamp used in optical or binocular assembly. I hope it's nothing to do with sewing machines. <laughs> yes, I do as well, John. Uh, Brian Ramsey says I'm not a member, but that's okay. Um, and this, but he thinks that's for Morse code input to transmit between thumb and finger. I suppose you could see it like a paddle. Yeah, like a paddle. Like a paddle. Yeah, maybe. Um, Bruce G. 4KZT. I'm not exactly sure what the purpose of this week's mystery object is, but I'm pretty sure it's a clamp for holding something flat and something round together without damaging either. I look forward to finding out more on Wednesday. And there we are. There are the entries that we had. I think all really quite good and ingenious, but, and some are closer than others, as you'll find out, but we can now reveal and tell you exactly what that was because this is what on earth it was. It is a spy camera bracket for binoculars. So a couple of you got really close. One mentioned a telescope. Another person, I think it was John, mentioned for binoculars. And that's what it does. There's a spy camera. I think it's a Minox spy camera, if you want to know the exact make. Um, and uh, that fit, allows you to take pictures through binoculars. And sent to us by Tony M0TDK. Thank you very much for sending us that, Tony. By the way, we're looking for more. If you've got anything like this hidden away in a drawer or a loft or whatever, um, and it's just, you know, vaguely guessable by people, then please send us a picture and we would love to use it. Anyway, we've got time now for the new competition where we ask you to tell us what on earth this is. A bit different. Mm-hmm. I thought I knew before I looked at the description. Should I just, can I just say that? No. No, oh, all right, I won't. So it may not be obvious, but I don't know. I might not say any more. No. This is the competition 
We'll be back in two weeks on NARC Live and we'll tell you what that is. So please let us know what you think that is. Send us your answers to radio at dcpmicro.com by three o'clock Wednesday week at the latest. But if you know now, why don't you put on an email now before you forget? And before we meet our tonight's guest, it's just time to tell you about what's happening at the club this week. So on Sunday, we've got the GB Tourist News on GB3 and B at seven o'clock. On Monday at 7.30, the Monday Night Net on GB3 MB, and at half past eight, the 80 metre CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, a week tonight, we're back at CNS for a social informal evening between 7 and 9 p.m. Hope to see some of you there. There'll be cold drinks and everything for sale, biscuits and stuff like that as well. Look forward to seeing you then. And by the way, the week after that, we're back with NARC Live. We've got an intriguing talk, which I don't know much more about, other than it's called Calling from Mars. So that should get, yeah, interesting mm. stuff. Anyway, as I said as well, please do send us your pictures and your stories and everything from what you've been doing during those these next couple of weeks, because we love to share them with everybody else. And also, we have this club card, which we can send. There's one to cheer people up, one for celebrating a birthday or an anniversary or something like that. And as you heard earlier, we also do a version uh, as a sympathy card for anybody who's lost somebody. We'll send it to anybody. They don't have to be NARC members at all. They don't even have to be radio amateurs. If it gives someone some cheer, it's worth us doing it. Just send details to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to say too much about what our guest tonight is talking about. It's Nick Totterdall, G4FAL, and he is actually the RSGB Contest Committee Chairman. But we know he's not here tonight to talk about contests as such. He's here with a talk about transatlantic tests. So good evening to you, Nick. Yep, good evening, David. Good evening, Tammy, and good evening to the rest of you um, who, are, who are listening at home or watching at home. Uh, just a couple of um, words of warning. Uh, one is that this talk is one that I've prepared for the RSGB convention in two and a half weeks time, um, because I wanted to talk about the same theme with you guys as I'm talking about there. Um, but it's uh, this, this is the first run through with a live audience. So there may be a few um, things where I have to stop and make notes of things I need to change. The other, the other word of warning is I have behind me on the floor a 31 <laughs> kilogram Labrador who is currently having a little doze, but he's very likely in the next 45 minutes to wake up and start barking, in which case I'll shove him out of the door behind me. But that'll just disturb things briefly. No, it's lovely that they share it. And can I just, uh, thanks Nick uh, for that introduction. Just to remind you all at home as well, uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Nick during this presentation or straight afterwards, then uh, please pop them on to BATC or Facebook and we'll either read them to Nick during his presentation or straight afterwards. But now back to you, Nick, for more details about the transatlantic tests. Yes, thanks, David. Um, Oscar does have a habit of um, coming underneath the table and lying on the foot switch when I'm operating SSB. And I wonder why on earth I'm transmitting. And then I realise there's, there's an animal <laughs> under the table that's lying on the foot switch. Okay, now this talk uh, is uh, is quite wordy. There are lots of words on the screen. You don't need to read everything, but do please try and get the gist of, uh, of what the story is about. Um, the reason it is wordy is that a lot of this is uh, taken from direct quotes from scanned magazines that were published 100 years ago, either in Britain or in the USA. Um, and the, uh, the, the RSGB convention is in two and a half weeks' time, so um, I'm hoping this will be, be fine for that, but there may be a few things to change in the meantime. Um, the main uh, purpose of the talk is to encourage you guys to take part in an RSGB activity that's happening in December. Um, we'll come on to that. So we're talking about transatlantic tests, um, and just to quickly summarise, there were four main tests that happened in the early 1920s between February 1921 and December 1923. And a quick summary is that the first test uh, test series in February 21 were a failure. The second series in December 21 
were a success for the ARRL. And then the RSGB's success came in December 1922, which is why we're going to be celebrating it this year. And then the fourth test, which were held in December 1923, were rather eclipsed by French success that had already happened just before the tests were going to happen. We'll explore all this in more detail, but it does explain the reason that the RSGB are celebrating particularly this year. So, where was amateur radio in the early 1920s? Well, we'll come on to that, but let's just think what our expectations are now. In, in 2022, I've got a couple here, but I'm sure you can think of more. Uh, we expect on the HF bands to be able to have two-way communication with people worldwide um, pretty regularly. And we can transmit and receive from our home using low power and relatively small aerials. Um, you can probably think of other things. But if we go back 100 years, let's go back to the 1920s. Uh, this was just after the First World War, and in the USA, uh, amateur radio had just restarted uh, in 1919. And by 1921, there was already a network of amateurs that were operating um, throughout the US. And they were able to transfer messages from one side of the country to the other in a matter of minutes. But this was by transmitting from one to another, writing the message down, then repeating it. Um, and then thirdly, as far as the technology is concerned, thermionic valves became available. And this was making a massive difference to two things. One was receiver sensitivity, and the other was that CW transmission was coming in to replace spark. So when we talk about CW, continuous wave, this was really made possible by uh, the introduction of thermionic valves. And I always find it a bit interesting with the ARRL, this whole business of third party messages, because that carried on uh, until fairly recent years. And there was this phone patch thing they used to do where people could um, could talk to their relatives via amateur radio in other parts of the world. Um, but it never really happened much uh, in the UK. And I don't think we really were licensed to to do that kind of third party communication. So the, the, things were pretty developed in the States, but in Britain, uh, it was a bit later before we got the amateur licenses back again. It was uh, in the mid-1920. Mid and at the end of 1920, a, a list of call signs was published um, when there really weren't very many of them. But by August 21, there were 127 British stations listed. Um, the license conditions were very restrictive. A transmit power limited to 10 watts, uh, like a foundation license. Uh, aerial dimensions were restricted, wavelengths restricted, and operating time. You can see in that little bit of printout there that some of these stations were only able to operate for two hours a day. Right, I'm going to just, just boot the dog out. Come on, Oscar, out you go. Run like somebody else. Good boy. He may, of course, return. That's all right. Well, actually, we did have one of our members online saying, uh, John, to his zero TWQ, says, is Oscar, Oscar licensed or not? Yeah, no, well, he's got a name from the phonetic alphabet. Yeah. Um, and that, he's Oscar because my brother-in-law already had a Victor because that would have been another good dog name from the phonetic alphabet. <laughs> but I also live in a place called Mosca, so Oscar is Oscar from Mosca. Oh, yes. OK, well, moving on, we can do a little comparison of things. I mean, obviously said a lot of this already. But by 1921, the states had thousands of radio amateurs. They were using high power and they had pretty unrestricted aerials. And they had this network thing, this um, relay where they were trans transferring messages around the country. And because of the high power, they had opportunities to pursue DX. Whereas in Britain, there were only hundreds of amateurs, low power, uh, aerials with, with restricted in dimensions. And sometimes the licenses even specified the, the other people who you could talk to and local contacts were more likely. Um, commercial stations were already using huge power and were spanning the Atlantic uh, quite successfully, but sort of on long wave uh, wavelengths. Um, and, and the other thing with radio amateurs is that they'd hardly 
begun to explore anything with wavelengths shorter than 200 meters. So really, amateur radio was on the, what we would now call the medium wave band. It hadn't made its way into the true short wave. But this transition would be the thing that would really make the massive difference later in the 1920s as amateurs moved into the short wave spectrum. So it was in this context, with the USA leading the way in amateur radio, that the whole concept of transatlantic tests came about. And it was a chap called Milton Sleeper, who was the wireless correspondent for a a magazine, I think it was a monthly publication called Everyday Engineering in the States. And in September 1920, he proposed, and he'd already spoken to British people in the meantime, proposed that there should be a, se a series of tests uh, run that would try and establish um, the receiving of signals from America in Europe. There was no thought of two-way communication at that point. And it's quite interesting. One thing he said is in that bottom square, he said, and it was a bit misogynist, I suppose, there's uh, no thought that it might be a woman, but um, his name, this is the person who transmits across the Atlantic, his name will never be forgotten as long as there are radio experimenters. And this was really a prophecy from Milton Sleeper that we'll come back to a little bit later. So in the build-up to these, this, um, what would become the first transatlantic test, but rather like the First World War, it wasn't called the first tests, because there was no thought that there'd ever be any more at the time. Um, and here we have Philip Corsi, who is a name who, uh, a chap who was very involved in um, the Wireless Society of London, as it was at that point. Um, and he had already been enlisted to be the sort of uh, European um, liaison for these tests. And then the other chap, and this, this, this fellow wrote a letter back to Milton Sleeper, um, saying that he'd love to get involved. And this was a French fellow called Leon Deloy. And this is really the first time his name comes up as he responds to the, uh, the suggestion of the transatlantic test. But Leon Deloy, as we'll find out later, really became the nemesis of British amateurs. He was the sort of joker where we were, were Batman, this sort of thing. Um, and uh, you'll see later that... Um, he wasn't greatly loved on this side of the channel. Okay, uh, everyday engineering, for some reason, actually met its demise at the end of 1920. And at that point, the ARRL uh, took on the responsibility for the transatlantic tests, uh, promising to see them through. So what were the rules for the tests in the, in the first series in February 21? Firstly, the test would be from west to east. So the Americans or people on North America would transmit and Europeans would listen for them. There would be three nights in February 21. <coughs> the US participants would include a, a unique code. <coughs> this is so that you could verify that you'd actually heard the thing because not only were they sending the call sign, but also this other bit of information and the reception would be verified by, by our friend Philip Corsi, because he would have the unique codes and only him. And then the chap at the ARIRL side was a fellow called Fred Schnell. He was their traffic manager, and it was his responsibility from the, the American side. Okay, well, <clears throat> the first tests only ran for three nights, and despite 250 UK stations registering to take part, only 30 actually submitted a log and none of them could verify receiving any US amateur signals. <laughs> so unfortunately, no verified reports. Various reasons were cited. For example, the tests were too short, <coughs> only three nights. Um, the Americans suggested the British were lacking experience and that the British were using inferior equipment to what the Americans had. Of course, on the United States side, and we're looking at a bit of writing from QST now, there was disappointment. And there's a fellow called Warner, 
who Kenneth Warner, who was um, the secretary of the ARRL at the time, and he made a rather bold statement that he would bet that uh, bet his new spring hat that if a good U.S. amateur with a, a set and a, a, like an Armstrong super could be sent to England, reception of U.S. amateurs would straightway become commonplace. And this bet comes up a bit later in the story. OK, plans were then made for a second series of tests scheduled for 1921. So in the build up to these tests, Fred Schnell, the traffic manager, proposed that the ARRL should send a qualified American amateur with American apparatus. And uh, this 32 year old Paul Godley was chosen a bit like a ringer, I suppose, to come to to Britain. In fact, they said England at the time um, in order to listen for the American signals. The ARRL were particularly good at cartoons in the 1920s, and this is a lovely cartoon from the, uh, the QST when this was all being discussed. I quite like the good night, I'm going to get out of here before the whole place blows up <laughs> comment from the chap on the right. But um, technically, you'll notice on the floor the rotary converters that were used um, for the HT supplies, as well as the two fans cooling the, uh, the vacuum tubes and the, uh, the rotary converter there. So they were entertained by the whole concept, I guess. But these tests were a big deal in radio amateur circles, and they featured in all the journals on both sides of the Atlantic. And this was now uh, European, the, the, the wireless world, which was pretty much the forerunner to RADCOM. And um, Philip Corsi encouraged British participation in the tests, but there was some disquiet at the thought of an American being sent to show us how to do it, as you can probably imagine. Now, I love this cover from QST from December 21, which was the month when the second test took place. And I particularly like the QRM babies who are lashed to a spike at the North Pole to keep the QRM down. And then if you look at the, the fella who's listening at the European end, he's got a pair of headphones and a, a G cramp holding them onto his head. <laughs> so the rules this time, as the first test, the second test was west to east, but this time for 10 nights. Again, the US participants would be sending a unique code. And again, Philip Corsi would have a, a magic brown envelope with the codes in it so he could check the logs. And uh, a chap called W. Whit Burnham for the Wireless Society of London took Warner's bet and said, well, uh, he didn't think the ARRL would achieve reception. And, and if they did, he'd send a hat. And if they didn't, they'd have to send a hat to him. So here's our man Godley, who was sent over uh, by the ARRL. And he was um, sometimes known as Paragon Paul. And that's because his radio there is, is a Paragon radio. He's just showing it off, probably making some money from selling it or something. Um, and here, here he is being sent off on the Aquitania to sail across to Southampton. Um, Paul Godley in the middle. On the left is Kenneth Warner, the, the, the man who wanted a hat. And on the right is uh, Schnell, the, uh, the ARRL traffic manager. It just so happened, by happy coincidence, that on board the same sailing was a fella called um, Harold Beveridge. Now, you've probably heard of Beveridge aerials, receive aerials. Well, this Harold Beveridge was the inventor. I think he looks a bit weird there. He looks like he's about 30, but he's trying to look about 60 with his uh, clothing. But you can see he's actually signed that, um, that card to Paul Godley from uh, H. Beveridge. And he used the voyage to convince um, Godley to use a beverage receiving aerial. Uh, and you can also see this reference to um, beverage being a hard boiled ham, which is not really an expression we use now, but I find that quite entertaining as well. So 
Godly arrived in England, <clears throat> so how did he end up in Scotland? Well, there were several reasons, really. He was wined and dined in London, but he headed to, uh, to Scotland to escape the atmosphere, the, the dirty atmosphere, that is, the radio conditions, and he had some promised help from Marconi setting up a receiving station on the coast uh, west of Glasgow at Ardrossan. And here's a picture of Godley's tent. I think you can just make out the uh, the posts that were supporting the beverage area on the right there. And then the inside of the tent, you can see his Paragon receiver on the left and some other sort of receiver on the right. And one of Marconi's staff who was helping sitting in the tent. And I think it was a pretty uncomfortable um, situation sitting in a tent in December, but they did have some heating. Uh, so how do things progress? Well, the 8th of December was the day when the test start, started and Godley really didn't hear anything. But come the 9th, um, he, he could hear the one BCG station, which is the uh, Radio Club of America station that had been set up in Connecticut. And uh, he was absolutely thrilled to hear this. And you can see there that he said it was the sweetest song I have ever heard. I don't know if you've ever had that experience when you've you've heard a signal or um, made a QSO in a contest with some remote place. I remember once I was in the Caribbean and I had a QSO long path on 15 meters in the night with a radio amateur in India. And it was just absolutely fantastic. It was like one of those moments that you live for in this hobby. Um, and that, this must have been the same with with Godley when he just picked up this American station for the first time. And then after a couple of nights of confusion, which I won't go into the details of, and a bit of frustration, on the 12th of December, Godley received his famous personal message. And this was like half a QSO, but this, rather than just hearing the station and being able to verify what it was, he actually had the personal message from the team who set up the, RC, uh, uh, the uh, RCA station um, in Connecticut. And they said, hearty congratulations from Burghard, Inman, Grinnan, Armstrong, Amy, and Cronkite. <clears throat> now, of course, the ARRL were hugely excited. Uh, this news even made it into the New York Times. The QST cover there we see, which was published in January 22, just after the tests, has a list of all the Spark and CW stations that Godley had verified. Remember, CW were the stations using the valves and Spark weren't using valves. And I uh, also was quite amused by that little first paragraph in QST. Oh, Mr. Printer, how many exclamation points have you got? Trot them all out, as we're going to need them badly because we got across. And there's the confirmation of the message back from Corsi uh, over to the States to say, many your stations heard by British amateurs. Now, <coughs> Burnham for the Wireless Society of London did send a spring hat to Kenneth Warner and he's, uh, the, the, the hat is still in the ARR office, ARRL offices. We're not actually sure that Burnham really knew what, what a spring hat was, um, but he provided this nice bowler hat with uh, messages about the wireless tests on, them, on it. And um, that hat is still there and I've seen more recent photographs of it. And there's Kenneth wearing the hat, um, looking very proud of uh, the achievement and it's also ironic that um, remember Milton Sleeper said that the um, the first experimenter to transmit across the Atlantic his name will never be forgotten well actually uh, we've mostly forgotten the names of the guys who did the transmitting it's the name of Paul Godley the fellow who received the first message that is remembered uh, and there is the copy or a picture of the plaque, which is on the wall at the old folks' home in Ardrossan, just adjacent to where the tent was erected. And I've seen this thing, but it's, it's very difficult to read. It could do with some paint or something on it. But anyway, it's a, it's a thing that the RSGB put up to commemorate um, Godley's achievement. <clears throat> As the dust settled, it, uh, it became clear that actually... Uh, although Godley had the first personal message, 
he wasn't the first person to receive a message or to receive um, the, the US stations. It was actually a chap called W. Byrne, not quite sure what his first name was, from Sale in Cheshire, who was uh, found to have verified receiving four amateur stations um, on the, the night of the 8th when Godley didn't manage to hear anything. But by the time this news came out in April, um, everyone had forgotten that uh, uh, and remembered, of course, that Godley was first. Well, he was first. He was the first person to have half a QSO, as I describe it. Hmm. OK, then we move on to yet another series of tests uh, a year later. So the excitement of the second tests in 21 led to the decision to repeat the tests in 22. And <clears throat> the new series of tests was announced by Fred Snell in QST in October 22. And also announced by Philip Corsi, who was still running the show in Wireless World in October. So what was the context for these third tests. We know that we'd already had the amateur signal received um, across, or several people had received it, but first of all, um, Paul Godley with his claim. Um, and uh, what had happened was that the, the month before the test, the Wireless Society of London became the RSGB. Um, radio amateurs were still using wavelengths around 200 metres. Um, the UK stations were still licensed to use low power and have simple aerials, but some special permits were requested to allow higher powers and bigger aerials for the specifically for the tests in December 22. This was the RSGB's opportunity to respond to the test in 21. But our nemesis Leon Deloy was still lurking. And he was a significant threat to the RSGB, who wanted, of course, to be the first ones to get across. So the, uh, the tests were arranged from west to east for 10 nights, then from east to west for 10 nights, either side of the winter solstice, because it was found that these wavelengths of 200 metres um, the opportunities to, to transmit long distances really were in the depths and the darkest times in the winter. Fred Snell was very excited about the prospect of hearing European signals, and he mentioned that uh, the, the, the guys in London and um, our friend Leon Deloy were both trying to, uh, to set up stations that could be heard over the pond, um, and these were anticipated in the States. OK, so the test started. And by the halfway point, a lot of American transmissions had been heard in Europe, uh, many more than had been heard the previous year. So things had progressed. Uh, the European receivers were better. And I guess more Americans were, were transmitting. But then we move on to the RSGB's part in this, uh, this set of tests. The story of 5WS, or what would now be G5WS, and we have the license for that call sign. The story was described in great detail in January 23, after the test, by, uh, by Corsi in Wireless World. So what did they actually do? Well, Philip Corsi and his team of RSGB enthusiasts got a license to use a kilowatt of power and a big aerial and the call sign 5WS. They approached an engineer at the generating station at Richmond to see if there was a location where they could erect the aerial and operate from. But the, the guys at Richmond weren't able to help. But they suggested that the RSGB went to the County of London Electric Supply Company, where they spoke to a Mr. Bacon, the chief engineer, who was very sympathetic. And he put the matter before the directors of the company and their consent was obtained to use the chimney stack at their Wandsworth generating station to support an aerial. This was no ordinary chimney stack, as you can see from the, the picture there. It was nearly 200 feet tall, 60 meters tall. And this is possibly the only time that the RSGB has employed a firm of steeplejacks. I can't imagine how they got to the top of that chimney, but they... 
fitted a halyard um, with a pulley so that the aerial could be yanked up. But you can get an idea of the scale from the people in the photograph. This was an absolutely massive construction that the aerial was yanked up to the top of. And here's a circuit of the transmitter they used. It's amazing how few components it had. But um, I mean, I'm not a great expert on these things, but I obviously picked out a few points. Um, it was keyed at the top right there on a 100 volt AC supply that came from a rotary converter. And this then went through a step up transformer to get the 6,000 volts for the, uh, the HT. And you can see the rectifiers uh, there to give, um, I guess, full wave rectification going both sides of the transformer. Um, and then just the simple circuit of the uh, the transmitting valves, which were oscillators and and um, and everything else in one go. Um, but this thing would put out a, a kilowatt of power. And they calculated that the 5WS transmitter was actually um, putting out more RF than one BCG, the Connecticut station had the year before. Then we come to the results. How did they get on with this transmitter? Well, it was on Christmas Day, 1922, that the message came via radio um, telegram to say that the, the 5WS station had been heard. I'm, I'm quite interested that the, the phonetics they were using there a uh, five watch sale rather than five whiskey Sierra, we'd say now. Um, and there was a Christmas message sent on Christmas Eve, which was heard. Uh, and this was a verification coming back from Snell. And what uh, what we really like about this, of course, is the, the last few words there, no French signals recorded. So this time we had beaten the French. And the full set of results were pulled together. A total of 315 American and Canadian stations had been heard across the Atlantic. But in the westbound tests, 20 different amateurs had heard the European signals, firstly from the RSGB 5WS and then from um, Leon Deloy, who did get across, but only in second place. So uh, the uh, 5WS was undeniably the first European amateur station verified to be heard on the west side of the Atlantic. Fantastic achievement. So 5WS was the first to get across. And we'll come back to this later because December the 24th, uh, 2022 is the centenary of this significant RSGB success, perhaps the, the biggest success in one event that the RSGB's ever had. Okay, but things progressed. Another year came and another set of tests were organized. Um, and as December 2023 approached, there still had been no two-way contacts made. And the fourth series of tests were scheduled for uh, December with the aim to progress a two-way contact. But in the meantime, while the preparations were being made for these tests, progress was being made independent of the tests and experiments were beginning to be made using shorter wavelengths, which, as we all know, would make a massive difference. And a fellow called Boyd Phelps had actually published something in QST a year earlier as he began to look at uh, shorter wavelengths. And our friend Leon Deloy made a special trip to the USA just before the tests were due in the sort of autumn of uh, 1923. And he did three things. He visited US amateurs at their stations and made plans to be able to make a two-way Atlantic QSO. He went to the ARRL convention in Chicago and met a lot of people there. And he bought some American equipment to bring back to Nice. And notably, he had a meeting with a fellow called John Reinhardt, a 1XAM, who had come up with a receiver design that allowed him to tune down as far as 28 meters. Oh, and um, quite, a, quite a massive uh, movement there. And true to his word, Deloitte came back to France and he was able to make the first two-way QSO 
And he actually had the QSO with Fred Snell, whose call sign was 1MO on 100 metres, followed by a QSO with, uh, with Ryan Arts 1XAM. So this time, Deloy had got there first, the first Europe to US two-way QSO. But only a matter of uh, short weeks later, a fellow called Jack Partridge, to a G2KF, also had a QSO with 1MO, but this time with Kenneth Warner. Remember the hat on the key, the first UK to US two-way QSO. Um, again, just before the tests were due to start. <coughs> And I think you'll find this interesting for those of you or those of us who complain about not having enough space for HF aerials. Take a look at Jack Partridge's house. This is where he did it all from. His address was 22 Park Road, Collier's Wood, uh, just outside Wimbledon, London, Southwest 19. And that was his house, that very narrow, detached house. And you can see it on Google Earth there. I mean, there's a bit of a garden. I think the garden probably goes back into the trees, but it was a pretty small plot. To, to have the first QSO from the UK to the USA. QST published the news of the two-way QSO and explained the move to 100 metres that had made it possible. And I quite like the way they refer to Deloitte as applying the dope he had collected in the States. Not the sort of dope we talk about nowadays, I don't think. And more amusing cartoons. Um, I like the one on the right, which shows the, the sort of status quo 200 meter man being knocked off his feet by the short waves in the little car. I'm not quite sure what word has been obliterated there. <coughs> what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the, uh, of course, the thing about the guy trying to speak French. I wonder if you remember your first QSO across the Atlantic. Maybe you've not had one yet. Um, I don't remember in huge detail, but I did look back and saw when it was. And um, I was a teenager in South London, not to, not very far from um, where Jack Partridge lived, actually about a mile and a half from there. And I, I got across the pond on uh, 20 metres CW. I had a pretty terrible report from this gym. Four three nine, but uh, nevertheless, it was um, it was okay. So then the test did happen. This time, the tests were rather eclipsed by the success of Deloy and Partridge, um, because the two-way QSOs had already been made. RSGB um, didn't use five WS this time; they used six XX. And G six XX is a call sign you may be familiar with that the RSGB have been using for some years for contesting. Um, also, the RSGB used a club call for G5AT. Um, and this, this series was east to west, so it was for the Europeans to try and get across to the other side. And here are some of the results. Now, I find this interesting. Basically, <coughs> Wireless, World Pub Wild Wireless World published the receive statistics from a number of stations there's only two of them that i've stuck on here but if you look at the call signs <clears throat> 2kf is jack partridge we've already talked about the fellow in collier's wood 2kw is burn who's the guy who heard the u.s stations before godly 2nm some of you might know that call sign that was gerald marcus who became the rsgb president and his call sign is still used by a museum station 2SZ, this was Mill Hill School, which became pretty famous the following year. 5AT was the RSGB, 6XX was the RSGB, and there was our friend 8AB, the French station of Lyon Deloy. All the eight prefixes are French amateurs. The P and NA prefixes are Dutch stations. So this was really the point when the transatlantic tests didn't mean so much now because we'd already had the two-way communication. But there was quite a lot of progress made very rapidly as people moved to the lower, the, the shorter wavelengths, the lower, the um, the higher frequencies. And in 1924, on the 16th of October, Ernest Simmons to Oscar Delta was heard in New Zealand. 
And then two days later, a school student at Mill Hill School, Cecil Goida, to S, operating the 2SZ station, managed to make a two-way QSO with Frank Bell in New Zealand. And after that QSO was finished, our friend Jack Partridge in his small detached house made the second QSO with New Zealand um, just after the one that, uh, with the schoolboy. So now we're looking forward. We're going to be celebrating December. Um, and let's just talk about that because we want to try and get as many RSGB members engaged as we can. Last December, you may remember, pub, uh, it was certainly mentioned in RADCOM, um, there were a, a number of celebrations uh, related to the success of um, Godly receiving the message over the pond. But the celebrations we had last year were pretty much um, exclusive for specialist um, top band stations and high power stations. We had the call sign GB2ZE, which was activated from Scotland with the Kilmarnock and Loudoun Amateur Radio Club, and then a team of guys from the GMDX group sharing the operating for six hours um, during the night, and the AWRL activated W1AW. I was up the whole night, and I was running G6XX that night, and it was really fun. But it was really not a very inclusive event. This December 2022, um, the celebrations are for all RSGB members to engage in. Our aim is to be very inclusive. So what is it we're doing? Okay, to celebrate the centenary, um, of the success of the uh, the 5WS station, the first to get across, we're going to be hosting an international amateur radio event, which we're calling the Transatlantic Centenary Tests. So not the, the ninth tests, but the centenary tests, uh, which we think makes sense. And these will be on the HF amateur bands for the entire month of December 2022. And the RSGB will be using the call signs that we held in the 1920s. We've managed with the help of Ofcom to reactivate all these call signs. So we have G5WS, which was the first to get across the pond in 1922. G6XX, which was used in the 1923 tests. G5AT, again used in the 1923 tests. And we have two other old RSGB call signs. 6ZZ that was used in 1924 and 3DR which was a Scottish call sign held by the Highland Division of the RSGB. Um, but also, we'll be uh, because we're not using the, the, the typical special event GB prefixes here, well, these are proper call signs, I call them. Um, and the 5WS suffix will also be activated from the Isle of Man, Northern Ireland, Jersey, Scotland, Guernsey and Wales. So altogether, we're going to have 11 call signs activated for the whole month. So what will this event consist of? Well, the historic call signs um, we've talked about are the 11 we just mentioned. A QSO with a special call sign will be valid for awards on three different modes, CW, phone, and digital. When we say digital, that's the sort of uh, any any uh, anyone from RTTY, PSK, FT8, um, FT4 or any other digital mode that you may choose to use. I suspect a lot of people will want to use FT8, although FT4 can be a bit quicker. And this will be on the nine bands from 160 to 10 meters. We're not using 60 meters because there really isn't the bandwidth for this sort of event. Um, and there'll be awards issued here. Um, bear in mind, we've got a possibility of 26 um, slots for each each call sign, um, a basic award for working each of the stations, and then the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum for working more and more. There's something like 280 possible combinations you could work. I suspect we'll struggle to get some of them activated enough to make many QSOs, but the top store, scorer in the UK and the top scorer internationally will be awarded a trophy. So what we're hoping is that during December, there are going to be a lot of activity from these call signs, a lot of RSGB members um, operating using them, and people will be very keen um, to make the QSOs. 
there are quite a lot of things happening in January next year, and this could be a bit of a training ground for international DX enthusiasts, um, particularly the, the Bouvet expedition and the WRTC um, marathon that's happening in January are going to make a lot of activity there. So we're getting in before the throng, if you like. And we've got um, <coughs> some very kind help from the club log team. So we're going to have a, a thing similar to what the expeditions have for award chasers um, on, on club log, combining the 11 call signs. Um, and most DX enthusiasts are very familiar with club log and with the leadership tables, um, and they'll be active for, the, uh, for this event. But this is where you come in. Um, what we're hoping is that we want every RSGB member who can operate an HF radio to take part. Um, if you're a full licensee, you can use one of these call signs from your home, uh, or you might supervise uh, an intermediate found or a foundation licensee to take part. You might want to use your club station. Um, and there are a lot of slots to activate because each call sign can be QRV on as many as 26 slots at the same time. So if your club was operating on 40 CW, another club could be op operating on 40 meter FT8, say. And we're asking each, uh, each booking, each uh, group who are booking to not book any more than three slots at any point in time. Um, but uh, you can also get access to these um, tables and if you wanted to change band, you could just delete yourself from one band and put yourself on another, leaving the band you were on previously for someone else to use. Um, so we were hoping to make a significant impact. Uh, all we need from participants is that they produce an ADIF file um, from their logging that can then be uploaded to Club Log. So how do you sign up? Well, if you're in, if you're where you guys are then it's Paul G4PVM, who is the person to contact. And the email address is very simple, g6zz at rsgbcc.org. So the suggestion is that uh, the different RSGB regions in England would use a particular call sign. Um, the G5AT call sign that we're calling the HQ station call sign is one that we'd like people to use once they've had a bit of a go with their local call sign to move on to to using the uh, the HQ call, because of course there isn't an HQ station that we can activate. Um, you may want as a club to, to put your names together and put them through to Paul um, by email. Um, that's up to how, you know, how you'd like to organize it, but also you can contact him directly. There are a lot more details about this whole event on the RSGB website. There are pages with more of the history but also more details of the event that we're, we're doing in December. And I really like you to seriously consider taking part. And if you have a, a good station, which you could let others use, then, um, then please uh, make arrangements to do that. The booking is now open. So if you've got ideas of dates, you'll be available in December. You could start uh, getting your call sign into the tables now. Okay, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, that's been 45 minutes, which is what we were aiming for, and, and I hope uh, I've enthused you. You've got a bit of ancient history, but also some opportunities to use modern equipment um, in, uh, on the HF bands in December and to have a bit of fun um, celebrating an old thing using new gear. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Nick. Um, well, as you say, I hope that's enthused lots of people. And of course, Norfolk Amateur Radio Club will be collating details of names and everybody and members that would like to take part. Um, just can I clarify one quick thing, um, Nick? You mentioned several times RSGB members. Understandable, the RSGB is organising it. Do you not only have to be a member of the club, but you, do you have to be a member of the RSGB to take part? Right. The way the licences are, they are... Um, they are all licenses that have been issued to the RSGB Contest Club. And to be a member of the RSGB Contest Club and therefore to use the call sign, you do need to be an RSGB member. Um, but that's just because of the way the licensing works. Um, there are, if you're not an RSGB member, there are um, offers for, I think, for free introductory membership that you might like to take up for the duration. 
but I don't have the details of them. Uh, but if you're not keen to join permanently, um, you could join uh, just for the just for December. All right, Nick. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that for those watching at home. So there we are. That's one of the first uh, calls to action, I guess. If you're a member of Norfolk Amateur Radio Club and you're an RSGB member or going to be, and you're interested in taking part, then you can drop an email to us here at narklive at radio at dcpmicro.com or get together other people's names as well and, and we'll do it as a group. But we will coordinate that, of course, and uh, it looks like a really good opportunity to make a, a lovely commemorative contact um, in December as well when the weather won't be quite so nice as it is, has been and it'll be a really good thing to do, I'm sure. So if you've um, enjoyed Nick's talk now and you've got any questions or comments or anything about from anything that he's uh, talked about, uh, he would welcome the feedback, as I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, we would as well here. One, one thing, Nick, I was thinking about is in 1922, I presume radio amateurs wouldn't have known much at all about propagation then, or, or am I wrong? Well, they obviously knew that on these um, fairly long wavelengths, things were better in the dark. And that's why they aimed to have things in December. But they also knew that conditions came and went. They knew that they were variable. And that's one of the reasons they thought the first set of tests failed because only three days didn't really give enough opportunity. And then even when um, Godley was in Scotland, he didn't, he didn't manage to hear anything that first night. And he put that down to atmospherics, but he also uh, strangely, even at that time, there was a lot of QRM about because there were already a lot of noisy stations, especially these ones using Spark, that were mm -hmm. basically making a horrible racket across the bands. Um, and there were harmonics. A lot of transmitters had harmonics that were uh, being, being able to be heard um, on 200 meters, but they weren't actually transmitting on 200 meters. So it was pretty tough. So we're not the only people who experience um, interference QRM, QRN. No, indeed. I mean, I think most of us uh, watching will understand and know the principles of CW, but the spark, uh, was it as crude as it sounds? Pretty much. I mean, the spark was the thing that um, put the energy into the, uh, the, the tuned circuit that made the thing transmit. Um, and that was pretty much the bigger the spark, the bigger the signal. But I don't know if you've ever heard of spark transmitting. It, it sounds a bit like a, a farting sound. It's, it's sort of a, well, someone blowing a raspberry. Um, but the harmonics and the, uh, the, the sort of size of the waveform is, is horrendous. Um, but that was what, uh, what people were using initially. And forgive, um, and forgive uh, my ignorance, Nick. Thank you. And uh, the, the spark, though, is that still CW, essentially? Is that still? No. Good? So how, no, you how, see, it wasn't, how, how do you get any... Sorry. It wasn't continuous wave. I mean, that's why they called. Uh, they started calling it CW when they were the valves, because then it was actually a waveform that was being switched rather than a sort of a, a, an oscillation caused by a spark. So how did you how did you get messages across then? I mean, how did uh, the the Brits uh, uh, Godley um, detect? Or, or, you know, that, that that was actually the code because you said they had... Uh, well, the yeah, well, it was still Morse code that was sent. Right, that's what I meant. But actually. it was, it was uh, we think of Morse code as CW. Well, that's not what it is. Okay. Um, CW is the continuous wave, um, but they were still using Morse code by interrupting the spark. Right, but it that's was a what sort I... of a horrible, horrible raspberry sound <laughs> that was being transmitted. Yeah, I and mean, that's what I sort of visualised, but I thought, well, that's going to be awful to listen to. But I guess these were really groundbreaking times. I mean, yeah. th we talked about this all from the aspect of an amateur being a, a radio amateur. Um, but, I mean, did have any, I presume that some of this had impacts in commercial world as well. And people started to realise that, you know, what this sort of communication could do to revolutionise revolutionize everyday life for everybody. Yeah, well, the commercial people, immediately the amateurs started using the shortwave. Um, people like Marconi also started to do the same thing. Um, but, of course, if you go back to things like the Titanic, uh, the, the transmissions would all have been spark in those days. There was no, uh, the, what, they didn't have the thermionic valves. So uh, that was all there was. Um, but it was still amazing what they achieved with it. But obviously a huge step forward. Um, and also the, the fact that you could make the, the receivers far more sensitive by using the thermionic valves for the amplifying stages, which really didn't exist before that. Yeah. I mean, in, I presume you've had to do personally, or you must have had an interest in it already, but you've had to do a lot of research into this. Have there been anything well, that you've 
learnt that you didn't expect and you didn't know about before that has surprised you? Well, I'll explain where all this came comes from. Um, when I took over as the HF, uh, it's just the HF bit that I'm involved in in the contest. I don't know much about VHF. It's a, a dark art to me. Um, you know, Andy G4PIQ is the guy who does the VHF stuff. Um, but uh, when I started getting involved in it, uh, one of my first aims was to have some proper call signs for the RSGB because uh, the Germans have a whole load, things like DA0HQ, which come up in contest. But RSGB didn't have any. We had these blasted GB calls, which are ambiguous because they, they are they could be any in any one of seven DXCC entities. Um, so I was keen to to find some decent call signs. And I spoke to Elaine at RSGB and she's she was at the time a sort of holder of the archives. And she said, why don't you try and get one of these old call signs from the 1920s? And that's when we got G6XX, which um, I know it's all history now, but uh, since we got G6XX, we've had well over 100,000 QSOs with it, and it's become a very well-known call sign. Um, but that then led me into thinking, what other what other old call signs are there? And we found G3DR, uh, which we've also been using. But then uh, I went a bit further and discovered there were more and more of these call signs, and that then got me into the history because I was starting to have to study the history to be able to go to Ofcom and say, look, there's this G5WS. We want to get this call sign back. And they'll say, well, prove it. And I had to find the, <laughs> the proof. Um, and that was really how I got into the history. Well, well, that's been, it's obviously been a really good journey for you as well and fascinating. And, and we're really grateful for you coming tonight to, you know, deliver this talk to us first, really. Um, and hope it's been a good train, you know, good practice ground for you as well. Um, we haven't really got any you know, questions as such with lots of comments about how much they've enjoyed the talk and, and everything else. So we really want to thank you very much, Nick, for doing this tonight. I know you haven't been feeling well as well recently and uh, you, you could have called this off, but I'm really pleased and, and grateful that you've, uh, con you know, you've said you'd continue to do this talk tonight for us. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, Dave. No, it's been really good. I just hope everyone hasn't just nodded off to sleep with all these words to read on the screen. Not um, at all. And of course, it's, it's, thank you for that. And it's also a good reminder to people at home as well that, you know, that these uh, programmes are recorded so you can watch them in the next coming days. Uh, and then, of course, you, if you want to look at some of the close ups of some of those pictures as well, um, then uh, you can zoom in. I mean, they are quite clear. We're looking at obviously a first generation here in the studio on an HD monitor. But I could read every single word of all those press cuttings and everything. So I'm sure people will be able to do that at home. So once again, we'd like to thank you very much for your talk this evening, Nick, G4FAL. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Many thanks. There we are. That was a fascinating talk. I mean, that's 100 years and uh, you know, how far we've come in 100 years. And yet, apart from the modes, I guess, which obviously have progressed a lot, some of those basic principles are, are still the same. So really interesting. And hopefully lots of you will be wanting to take part of that in that in December. So don't forget to uh, drop us an email and we'll, I'll start collating all those email addresses and names. This is the address to write to for that or anything else to do for NARC Live, radio at dcpmicro.com. Let us have that as soon as you can and we'll collate these names and then we'll get them to the RSGB and we'll, we'll start progressing with everything else needed to do. Really sounds like a great thing to do in December. That's about it for NARC Live for tonight. Um, just a thanks uh, once again to Nick G4FAL for his presentation. And uh, remind you what's coming on the club this week. We've got the GB Tourist News at 7 o'clock on GB3MB at, uh, on Sunday. On Monday at half past seven, the Monday Night Net on GB3MB. And at 8.30, we've got this 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, the 28th of September, we're meeting in person again at the CNS School in Norwich between seven and nine. Hope to see lots of you there. And then of course, we'll be back here in two weeks time for Calling from Mars, the talk that's on the 5th of October. But uh, meantime, thank you very much indeed again for joining us and thanks to Nick. And so from Tammy M0TC. Bye-bye. And from me, David E7RP. <coughs> take care of yourselves. See you soon. Bye-bye.